Minneapolis Mayor Betsy Hodges joins me on The Daily Circuit. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me here. I'm glad you're here. KSTP ran another story last night defending the story. And after the story was over, the shot returned to the news anchor, reading a statement that includes this line. We believe this is an example of police doing their job to protect the community. This is important. This is KSTP giving an opinion saying this story, the original story, was an example of police doing their job to protect the community. Do you agree? Well, I think the real story here is about uh, the context in which all of this was given. Um, that, And what I wrote in the blog post as well is that there's a whole series of questions that had to be answered in questionable ways to get to the conclusion that uh, the story drew. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, was I supposed to be pointing or not? Was that good judgment or not? But that can't be the only question because there are dozens, as is well documented on the Internet, of photos of me pointing uh, and of all kinds of leaders pointing that have never been questioned in terms of gangs. And so then the question is, should I be talking with members of the community and members of the public who, uh, whose criminal background I don't know? And that speaks to whether or not I should be doing my job. I was a mayor who was elected on a platform of one Minneapolis. Uh, the expectation is that I will be out there talking with members of the community from all walks of life, which is what I do, which is what I do. I can't possibly know the backgrounds of everybody, and even if I could, I wouldn't. Uh, I need to be out with my community. And then so that begs the question, well, then, should I have been uh, standing next to a young African-American man um, and not using stereotypes? In other words, the assumption is, and I think this gets to the heart of the matter, that people have stopped short of saying uh, that the mistake I made was not using uh, stereotypes about young African-American men when I was standing with one, and that I should have assumed that he had a criminal background, and I should have assumed that criminal background was associated with gang activity, and as as such, I should not have, uh, I assume, used any gesture, um, let alone, you know, except that I used one of the most common gestures in human history. And so the, uh, you know, the implicit assumptions in all of that are, are, are ludicrous. They're just ludicrous that this is not, you know, this is not a matter of, uh, you know, judgment about pointing. I think the questionable judgment that people fall shy of saying is the questionable judgment is that she should have been using her stereotypes. Does the narrative, in your opinion, change as KSTP has further reported more details about the background of the man in the photo that you're with, Navel Gordon? You know, the story is never, you know, it just the inconsistencies in the reporting um, have been notable. Um, it includes: is the story about my judgment, or is the story about Navelle? If it's about my judgment, what port? You know, what piece of it uh, is that? Is it a story? You know, and then is uh, the man I was with is 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 he a gang member or is he not? And and they say that. You know, we'd have no evidence of that, but then the reporter himself on social media, et cetera, uh, has that implicit assumption. So the inconsistencies um, and the context in which all the questions are being asked, that's the real story. That's the real story. And part of the context is, you know, we've got work to do in terms of making sure we have the best possible community relationships, uh, that the police force has the best possible community relationships. And that's the biggest picture. Uh, that's the biggest task at hand. Do you think KSTP should apologize? You know, certainly not to me. I mean, they don't owe me an apology. Um, and I think that's for the viewers and the advertisers to decide. Uh, the story also includes... Um, voices from the police union and a former police officer. Uh, do you think this story was about the police union finding a way to go after you in the media? You know, that's a speculation that is out there, and it's a speculation that I share. Um, you know, the, the timing comes after clear statements uh, by me about expectations uh, for standards and behavior uh, for all our officers. And I need to be clear. Uh, you know, there's a difference between an officer who has a bad day on the job and an officer who has a clear and consistent pattern of misconduct. And it's those latter officers that uh, really are doing damage to police community relationships and really violating the standards that we hold uh, for our officers. And so, um, you know, and the, and the head of the police union 
uh, you know, recently wrote an editorial essentially saying he doesn't see uh, that there's an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, and that saying there's an issue that needs to be addressed is a problem in and of itself. And that's just a place where the two of us disagree. But it has led to uh, an environment where there's an effort to discredit the work overall. Have you talked to John Delmonico since this story uh, happened and, and aired? I have not. I have not. It is my intention to reach out to him once uh, the waters have calmed a little bit. Uh, you know, we do have and need to have and continue to have a working relationship moving forward. Uh, certainly there's an inherent place where the union and the leadership of the city uh, sit down, and that's at the collective bargaining table. Uh, the other point that's been noted in some of the response to the original story on television was that while you were out that day doing Get Out the Vote efforts, you were with the chief of police, Janae Harto. She wasn't in the photo that went on television, but she was standing right over there. It wasn't in the photo. What? What? We have also reached out to the chief, and she has so far declined to come on this radio, but what does the chief think about all this? You know, I, I can't speak for Chief Harto. Uh, I think it's appropriate that as the person in the photograph, I am, I am the person out um, at this point speaking to it. Um, the expectation I've had of the chief, which she has met um, and exceeded is that she will continue to do her job and do it well, and that she will continue to move forward on the vision that she has put forth for the department that I share, which is MPD 2.0, which is a set of standards um, predicated on the belief uh, that every, you know, she asks that every officer ask themselves after an interaction with the public, is that how I would have wanted a member of my own family treated? So my expectation of the chief is that she will continue to do her job. The next day, we in, we did a press conference, announced the body cam pilot project, that it was starting that day, um, and the work has moved forward. What's wrong with uh, police, in this case law enforcement sources, as they noted in the, the story, saying we are concerned about gang-related violence. Here's this thing that we think might be this thing going on, so we're going to call attention to it. Is there something inherently wrong with that? Uh, like you said, uh, the the news station and the reporter cited multiple law enforcement agencies uh, contacted us with this concern. Um, you know, certainly people can have that question, um, but that wasn't what the story was. You know, the story wasn't necessarily, hey, there's a public safety issue here. It was, oh, the mayor's judgment. And that gets you back into that entire swirl of what exactly is being questioned here and what exactly did people, uh, what exactly did the union president and what exactly did that, you know, the folks who did that story, what did they exactly want me to do differently and why? And that context leads to a number of disturbing conclusions about uh, race and about um, assumptions that are, you know, that people expect me to make. And at the end of the day, it's a ludicrous story, and so you really do have to question the motivation. Mayor Betsy Hodges from the city of Minneapolis is with us here uh, this hour, her first interview since this story that's become known as Pointergate uh, kind of debuted a week ago, I would say. Uh, the mayor had her first response online last night on her own website. We've linked to that as well at nprnews.org. In the post, you also note you intend to increase, quote, increase accountability for consistent bad actors in the department. And that while there may be few of these officers, you're concerned about the impact on the whole department. What are those steps? Well, I have, you know, a, a few weeks back, I outlined in an open letter the work that we're doing uh, in the city of Minneapolis uh, and that I am partnering with Chief Harteau and, and members of the city council to move forward. Um, and that includes community policing, more police officers. Uh, I proposed in my budget making sure that we are recruiting a department that looks like and recruiting officers who look like the communities we serve through our community service officer program. Uh, it includes body cams, um, which, <clears throat> excuse me, which creates accountability um, and more clear, uh, you know, another tool and another piece of, of data that we would have to assess what happens in interactions between the community and, and the police. Um, you know, the chief has put forward MPD 2.0 and clear standards that, you know, guide uh, behavior in the department and also guide determinations of when those standards have been um, breached. And so, you know, the work moves forward and continues on. Even if it was brought up in a tangential or, in your opinion, confusing way, uh, what is the status of gang-related violence in Minneapolis? Is it up? Is this a major problem in the city? 
Well, of course, we have gang-related violence um, and that we have our youth violence prevention blueprint. I'm co-chair of that, which we've been getting really good results on for many years. But again, that isn't explicitly, actually. It was said in the story itself that that was not at issue here. And again, as you said, that was in contradiction uh, you know, the contradiction with other things that were being said. And at the end of the day, that's not really the point. The point is we, uh, the people of Minneapolis elected a mayor to go out and talk with everybody in the city of Minneapolis. Uh, and there's, and I take that charge very seriously. Do you think the uh, KSTP story was racist? Yes. Why? Um, because of the implicit assumption, because the only trail that it takes you down is one where at the end of the day uh, we are to assume uh, I was expected to assume that the person I was talking to uh, because he was a black young male I was to assume that he had a criminal history I was to assume that that was a gang related criminal history I was to make decisions based on that that included not interacting with him uh, and certainly not using any gesture that could be uh, any gesture at all, which is its own um, questionable premise. But really, it wasn't about the gesture. Really, it was about who I was standing with while I was making a gesture. And that was, uh, you know, the entire conversation about that, implicitly and explicitly, was about race. And it was about uh, judgments based on race. When you, when you bring that up, then, when you say this is about race... Shouldn't we, though, take a moment and say, you said that the assumption was that anyone I talk to who's African-American has a criminal background. Well, as it happens, in this case, this young man does have a criminal background. Walk me through what that means, how we should still be having those conversations, when in some cases, some of these, as again, you're noting tangential facts, do end up being true. Well, the question is not whether or not somebody has a criminal background. I assume every day I am interacting with people who have criminal backgrounds, either embezzlement or DUIs or, uh, you know, too many parking tickets or, you know, gun or drug possession, whatever it is. Every day I'm interacting with members of the public. So the question isn't about whether or not um, the question isn't whether or not I should be um, interacting with members of the public who have criminal backgrounds. Uh, what, what people are implicitly saying is that I should be assuming that about young African-American men, and I should be basing um, decisions about uh, everyday interactions with them on that set of assumptions. And that leads us down a terrible path where we are, where people, where that story and the union president who was complicit in that story were essentially saying, Mayor Hodges, don't have those interactions. Um, don't talk with young African American men. Um, and I would posit, I should be talking with young African American men regardless. Regardless, and the fact that we think that there uh, that would be too scary a thing to contemplate, um, that's the problem. That's the path we go down um, that leads us nowhere and helps us solve no problems. I was actually speaking last night in an event with NPR's TV critic Eric Deggins. He's written a lot about media criticism and race in the media, so it happened to come up in our event. He also cited, though, studies that bemoan the, how the media in general, only discuss race when there's a crisis. Ferguson, Missouri, uh, Trayvon Martin, um, you know, P Pointergate, and that it actually backfires. It's that when you try to have a discussion about race at its most fevered pitch, you actually get people kind of retreating to the corners and feeling attacked, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I was actually going to ask a question, but you look like you're going to say something to that. Well, <laughs> Yes. And that, and one of the things I'm proud of is that for the last two plus years, or I would say my entire adult life, I have been doing my best to have that conversation under all circumstances. My entire campaign, the year that I ran for mayor, was about talking explicitly about race, about the fact that in Minneapolis we have the biggest divisions, uh, the biggest gaps between white people and people of color of any city in the country on employment, on education and housing, and that the people of Minneapolis were thirsty for that conversation and they were thirsty for it at a time when it wasn't an acute crisis. And I will note that 
The conversation about race played out on the stories on the station that was running the stories have included no voices of people of color. There have been no African-American people. They've aired three stories, and one of those stories they aired twice. Um, and in none of them did they talk to any members of, of any community of color, uh, let alone the African-American community, about their response uh, to the issue, to the situation, to Pointer Gate, whatever you want to call it. And I think that's a notable omission um, and one that ought to be corrected. If we're looking ever at a story or general public discussion through which we do look through a prism of whether, for example, a person has a criminal record, aren't there times when that actually is quite appropriate to point out, actually, you know what, you need to know this person has a criminal background or this person is related or uh, associated with a gang? Um, you know, certainly there are stories where that's relevant, um, particularly if it's a story about crimes that have been committed by a person. Um, but this wasn't one of them. Where do you think the mayor-police relationship goes from here? You know, the police officers in the city of Minneapolis are a smart bunch, uh, and they're an amazing group of dedicated public servants. Um, and I know that every day, uh, you know, and they continue, you know, with all this fuss happening at this level, every day our police officers are going out there, and they are doing their jobs, and they are doing their best to protect and serve the public, and I know that. And I know that the conversation about community policing and good police-community relationships is as much about officer safety as it is about community safety, that when that relationship is good, everybody in the community is better off, including our police officers. So there are conversations to be had. Um, there's communication to have, a back and forth. Um, but I think the work continues to move forward, and my commitment uh, to the work continues forward. How do you think morale is in the department? You know, I think that uh, morale is high. Why? Because, you know, increasingly uh, people's voices are being heard, their work is being appreciated. Um, I think there have been some challenges lately, of course, and I, and I think that has to have an impact on how people and officers would see their relationship to the community. Uh, the community has been pushing back a lot, um, and that's on me to make sure that officers know that I understand there's a big difference between an officer who makes one mistake, who has one bad day on the job, um, versus you know, the handful or few couple handfuls of officers who have, you know, consistent um, patterns of misconduct. And that when we address that, that makes it uh, a better working environment for everybody, for everybody. When we hold those officers up to the highest standard and make sure that those standards are met, and if not, um, that appropriate action is taken. So I understand that there, uh, there's been some question and some tensions lately. Um, and you know, the message that I carry uh, to our officers is I know you're doing a great job. I know you're doing a great job, um, that there's a difference between having a bad day on the job and, uh, you know, a consistent pattern of misconduct. And together we can work uh, to make a great force even better. Uh, are there contract negotiations imminent with the police? Uh, you know, we just did uh, a wage reopener uh, where we talked uh, specifically about wages, and I think there's still some time before we do a full, uh, I think there's about another year until we do a full contract renegotiation. Will this be on the table even if no one says the words out loud at that time? It doesn't have to be, no. I mean, what needs to be on the table are the issues that we both bring to it. Uh, you know, Lieutenant Delmonico, who's president of the union, uh, you know, he, he knows that it's a matter of business and it's a matter of negotiation and the collective bargaining table is an inherent place where we have those conversations. You mentioned that your desire is to continually have the conversation, to keep talking about race and racial inequities, even when it's not a time of crisis or fever pitch. That it, it's one of the ways we have to actually do something about our racial divides is if we're consistently talking about it and having it on the table. Uh, so so then talking we, is doing because there might be people who think if you're just talking about it, you're not fixing anything. Uh, you know what? You have to have the conversation to create the space to get something done. But I don't mistake that 
for the work that we need to do, uh, like moving forward on making sure that kids have healthy starts, which is one of the focuses of my uh, Cradle to K program. Uh, you know, we need that conversation to open up space to talk about body cams, which are a crucial piece of police community relationships. Uh, we need to open up, we need to have that conversation, uh, you know, to talk about uh, you know, the, the work we need to do to uh, help people become better parents and to help uh, young people um, who are having kids become better parents or parents of adolescents. We need to have that conversation to move forward on our youth violence prevention plan, uh, which has been having good results, making sure we're wrapping, uh, you know, caring adults around kids and identifying kids who are at risk and, and helping them not, helping them avoid uh, a bad path. All of that work uh, goes better um, and people work together better in an environment where we're having consistent, open conversation about race. Going forward, what do you hope happens in the next few weeks? You know, I hope that we can transform this into a conversation about how we want to move forward together. What have we learned from this about how we talk about race? What have we learned from this about what we want and expect? Um, you know, from our leaders um, and from our department, uh, you know, from the union leader, for example, um, and that that leads us to, um, you know, conversations that aren't in the heat of the moment about how we want to move forward together as a community. Uh, you know, the focus uh, needs to shift away from, uh, you know, the mayor pointing and toward let's all look forward together to a future where we are one Minneapolis and where together everybody has the opportunity to benefit from and contribute to our prosperity and growth and what's getting in the way of that and how do we change it. If there are people, though, who still say, no, Mayor, you were, that is a known gang sign, or they, they are caught up on that and they still continue to say you made a mistake, you know, is there is that greater discussion you're hoping for forever stunted um, because there will be people who continue to criticize what happened here on, on you. Uh, there may be. The question is, what is the motivation behind that criticism? At a certain point, um, that is a fruitless conversation. Um, and what is the motivation behind wanting to keep that uh, conversation going? And if the motivation is um, to detract from the actual real work that we're doing and needs to happen moving forward, then it's incumbent upon all the rest of us, everybody who's been having this conversation, everybody who posted on Twitter and on Facebook and who wrote blog posts and sent email messages, all of us to not succumb to that um, that tactic of trying to detract from what really matters in the city of Minneapolis, and that is the community. And you asked early on, uh, am I owed, you know, you know, should the station apologize? Certainly not to me, um, but at some point the community deserves an apology because this has detracted from the real and strong work um, that we have been doing together. Do you think the African-American community deserves an apology or the entire community? Uh, you know what? I think the entire community, because the extent to which one part of our community is targeted is the extent to which our co entire community is diminished. You mentioned ads earlier. Do you think there should be a boycott of advertisers uh, who continue to advertise with KSTP? You know, that's for the viewers to decide. That's for the advertisers to decide. You know, it's 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 my job to to speak to what I think the larger issues are here. Um, and for me, it's it's less about this story and more about the implications of it. Do you think you'll grant an interview to KSDP if they want? Oh, I'm sure at some point in the future we'll do another interview, I'm sure. Have you talked to Navelle Gordon since this happened? No. Do you want to? What would you say to him right now if he's listening? You know, at, at some point, certainly I will talk to Navelle. And, you know, were I to talk to him, I would, I would say, um, you know, I think the most important thing that happened that day is he and I knocked on doors and asked people to vote. Your support for the organization, NOC, Neighborhoods Organizing for Change, uh, at all changed by this episode? Oh, certainly not. Certainly not. They did a uh, fabulous work getting people out to vote. You know, uh, uh, voting uh, levels were down nationwide and state statewide. And in the areas that NOC was focused on, it went up, I think, 13%. If you, if you come back here in a year and we kind of rethink all of this and talk about this again. What should we look at to decide whether race relations have improved, police 
city relations have improved, kind of all of that. How, how should we measure this in the next year? You know, I, I, I think two ways. I mean, one, there are, we have results measures that we would take a look at, and are we on the right track, knowing that most of the things that need to change have very long trajectories um, and that we need to look at the spaces in between. Uh, you know, we need to you know, we need to take stock in between, but we need to look at the trends over time. And then we also need to ask ourselves, did we continue moving forward on the work that matters? Uh, did we continue, you know, moving forward on the body camera project? Did we continue mm -hmm. moving forward hiring people in CSO classes? Um, you know, is, you know, we are in the process. Uh, I'm chairing a group that's putting together an equity action plan for the city of Minneapolis. Is that work continued forward? Those are the real questions. Um, and I think a sign of success will be those are, that's what we'll be talking about. And we won't be talking about um, who pointed at whom and what did it mean. One final question just on the report. Last night, this follow up report focused more on Novell Gordon and they uh, uh, noted that there's this Instagram account and they claim that that's him and there are f photos of him holding guns and captions that include F the police and other disparaging comments. Does that matter? You know, that wasn't the premise of the story. I mean, I can't speak to those photos or, or you know, Novell or why he took them. Uh, but what I can speak to is the context in which that story was raised. I mean, I know, uh, you know, I can't speak to Novell's motivation for that, but, but we can make some assumption about the news station's uh, motivation for reporting that. Uh, and it's, you know, one of the other consistencies in the whole thing was they've insisted that the story isn't about who I was standing with. It was about my judgment. But then they've made the story about who I was standing with. And that um, that just speaks to me about uh, that story and uh, its quality and um, the things people weren't willing to explicitly say um, about, you know, the question about my judgment was less about pointing and more about who I was standing with. And the implications of that are all on race. And that's the context in which any of these stories have to be viewed. Minneapolis Mayor Betsy Hodges, uh, we had talked, so we were only going to talk until 1130. So you've given me a few extra minutes and I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.